Welcome everybody to the Thoughtful Bro. We are live streaming on a mighty blaze today. Um, we are here as usual every Tuesday at two o'clock to talk about what make great what makes great books tick, what makes great authors tick. Um, and you're in for a treat this week. This is pure joy for me. This is like one of those books. It's not like I don't like all the other books, but this is like so my cup of tea. Um, it's just like this book is just a direct hit for my tastes. So um, it's going to be a great, great interview. Um, a few things about A Mighty Blaze before we get started. Um, a Mighty Blaze, for those of you who don't know, and if you don't know, Shame on you. No, but if you don't know what a Mighty Blaze is, um, we're a group of writers and publicists and people in the publishing industry who got together about a year ago um, or nine months ago when COVID started because all of our friends had their book tours canceled and um, we wanted to help out. Um, and so since then, we've built a big kind of cool organization, about 25 of us. Um, and we do about a half a dozen interviews um, every week. Um, some recent people that we've done include Lev Grossman, Lionel Shriver, Jeff Vandermeer, Ellen Hildebrand, Erica Jong, Dean Kuntz, Judy Bloom, John Irving, Edward Standicat, Cheryl Strayed, and just last week on The Thoughtful Bro, Jonathan Leatham. Um, so it's there's new content almost every single day. And uh, if you want to support us, we're just an all volunteer organization, just like us. Give us your eyeballs, give us your time, check out some of our interviews and like us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and Facebook. Um, if you have a question for our author today, Eric Weiner, um, please just put it in the comments on the Facebook page and it will make its way to me and I will ask him. Um, and on that note, I'm going to give Eric a little bit of an introduction. Um, for those who don't know Eric, um, Eric is a former foreign correspondent with um, NPR and a reporter for the New York Times. Um, his books include The Geography of Bliss, The Geography of genius, um, as well as the spiritual memoir, Man Seeks God. Um, Eric's books have been translated, translated into more than 20 languages. Um, his latest book just released is called The Socrates Express in Search of Life Lessons from Dead Philosophers. Um, it is about how, there it is, um, it is about how everyday folks like you and me can learn from some of the greatest thinkers of all time and apply their wisdom into our everyday lives. Because as we all know, in America, if it's not applied, it sort of doesn't exist. So um, NPR said of this book, um, quote, with plenty of humor and straightforward prose, Weiner makes philosophical thought an appealing exercise that improves the quality of our everyday experiences. Eric, welcome to The Thoughtful Bro. Thank you, Mark. I'm happy to supply some kindling for that mighty blaze. There you go. There you go. I love it. I love a good extended metaphor. Um, so, um, so, so, Eric, I mean, just like I said at the top, I mean, um, this is so my cup of tea. It's like one of these books that I, I like read the description and I'm like, how did I not write that book? This is just this like it's like it's almost like you hear a pop song on the radio and you like immediate like immediately like it. And they're like, how is this book not written already? Like this is right. a book that just seems so obviously something that the world needs. Um, so um, anyway, I, but I don't, I've talked about it enough. Why don't you just kind of describe for our audience what Socrates Express is about? Oh, well, I would say it's a, a philosophy book for someone who maybe has never picked up a philosophy book in their, in their lives. Um, and I even, <clears throat> I'm even hesitant to use the word philosophy, even <laughs> though it's about philosophers, because as you sort of alluded to, that word has just you know, been sort of denigrated from where it began in ancient Greece some 2,500 years ago as this sort of this way of being in the world, right? I mean, philosophy, the word comes from the ancient Greek philosophia, which means literally lover of wisdom. I mean, and that is much sexier than the current meaning of philosophy, where, you know, love and wisdom often don't enter into the course curriculum. Uh, so, so yeah, it is, it's a book, I would say, their long-winded way of saying it's really a book about wisdom and about life and about trains. And about trains. Yeah. But, but so that's like the essence of the book, but more right. specifically, you want to just talk about kind of like the nuts and bolts. Of right. So it's, it's I, I tried to bring, um, the, it was said of Socrates that he was the first to bring philosophy uh, down from the heavens and introduce it into people's homes. And I'm trying to like continue that tradition and bring it down even further and, <laughs> and you know, into the Zoom room. Um, so I, I do that by uh, naming each chapter as a how-to question, um, but such as, and, and simple things, things that everyone can relate to, like how to get out of bed, like Marcus Aurelius, how to see, like Thoreau, how to wonder, like Socrates, how to walk, um, 
And uh, it's organized in three sections, the first being uh, Dawn, and that sort of paralleling, um, talk about extended metaphors, uh, the course of your, your day and your life, and the questions that, that are of concern to you when you're younger, like seeing, walking, enjoying. And then it segues to noon and the questions that uh, you wrestle with in the prime of your life, how to fight, how to be kind, and things like that. And there's, yes, the dusk section, which is um, toward the end of your days when you start to ask questions like how to cope and how to grow old and even, even how to die like Montaigne. Um, so the idea is that you've got in this one book a philosophical user's manual to life and to being a human being. Awesome. That is, it's, that's exactly what it is. It's a great description. And a couple young guys like us, I think dawn and noon is sort of probably the most applicable for us. Like those are the more relevant sessions. Yeah, um, definitely not dusk because we're not, we're not old. We're not anywhere near old. Uh, yeah, we're just right. a couple, couple of thoughtful bros having a conversation. <laughs> well, <laughs> By the end of this, you're going to make it plural and it's going to be thoughtful bros. Okay. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Yes. Um, all right. So yeah, I mean, so one, so the biggest thing about this for me, like what's so great about it is the way you do bring it down to earth. And, um, you know, I just remember when I was in college, I was actually, uh, I studied abroad in London one year and I took a philosophy course there, or I began to take a philosophy course and I just ghosted on it. I remember just one day very early on, uh, after a few weeks in the, in the course, I just, I just left the course. And the reason was, I mean, a part of this is I think like the British way of teaching philosophy, but it was all about logic and these kind of like logical building blocks and like really kind of it was very mathematical um and i it, it was just seemed like not only was it just not applicable in any way but frankly it was just almost impossible for me to understand without a strong kind of foundation in, in logic and reason and all these kinds of things. And I just, what I always craved was these kinds of books. And I'll name two books that I think are great comparables and I, others I think have brought this up, but two of my favorite all time books, Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy mm -hmm. and of course, Sophie's World. Right. Um, I mean, I think your book is sort of in between them. It's a little bit more sophisticated than Sophie's World, but um, kind of not as, it doesn't have that kind of like rigorous and breadth uh, of, right. of Bertrand Russell, um, but you, you're very much in this vein of like trying to have the rubber meet the road. And I guess my question to you is, why doesn't the rubber meet the road so often? Oh boy, that's a really good question. Um, the, the, your experience in the college in London is unfortunately all too familiar. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> you know, logical positivism, positivism, which is what I think you were, they were attempting to teach you is one aspect of philosophy, but it's recent and it's small and it's not part of that original tradition, that love of wisdom mm. and the how, the how to live. Um, and um, unfortunately, I think that philosophy has been, boy, I hesitate to say this, but I'll say it anyway, it's been hijacked uh, by specialists and academics. And when something becomes specialized and academic, a jargon is developed around it. And I do believe that jargon is in whatever the field serves one purpose and that's to separate the insiders from the outsiders. Um, it's not really to convey information because you can convey information in simple language. And uh, no less of a genius than Einstein once said, if you can't explain something simply, it's because you don't understand it well enough. Mm -hmm. And that that's my philosophy. Um, it, you can have complex ideas but my challenge is to explain them simply without oversimplifying them. And it can be done. Um, you know, back even in as far back as the 1850s, Henry David Thoreau, he wrote these exact words. He said, all around us, there are professors of philosophy, but no philosophers. And that was 150 years ago. And the trend unfortunately has headed in that direction, but there's still, and this is what I try to show in my book, there's been this thread from Socrates right up to Simone de Beauvoir. We're talking from you know, 400 BC to the 1980s when Simone de Beauvoir passed away. There have been philosophers, heroic philosophers who have kept the faith and kept practicing philosophy as something personal, something relevant, and yes, yeah, something, something practical. Oh, so well said. And, and, it, and that is backed up by the book. I mean, it's just, um, the book is just on every page. There's just, you, you keep it so close to, to our current life. And, and, and I want to like, ask a further question just about that. I mean, so when I was reading this book, not only was I thinking like, 
God, I wish I'd written this book. But I was thinking like, I wish I sort of had the life that you led when you read the, when you wrote this book, because this, like some of your other work, is also a travel log. I mean, you are kind of traveling all around right. the world. Um, can you talk about the way that travel fits into to this book? Because it's okay. Central. Well, I, I mean, I am a place person. Like yeah. when when I am presented with a topic or I sign on to write about whatever it is, wisdom, happiness, genius, you know, instead of saying who or what, I, I jump to the where question, like where, <laughs> you know, and then I get to the, the who and the what, but the where comes first. And so I think it's important to, um, to walk in the footsteps quite literally of Socrates or Nietzsche, whoever it is, and, and to, you know, try to channel whatever it is and wherever it was that they had these ideas. Um, I also think that um, philosophy and travel have a lot in common. My, my all time favorite observation about uh, travel is from Henry Miller. He said that one's destination is never a place, but a new way of looking at things. And to me, that that's why I travel. And that's why I've been studying and reading and, and immersing myself in philosophy not to know more or to experience pleasure, which is one advantage of one, one thing we get out of travel, but to look at things differently, to look at life differently, to look at the world differently. And I know you've had, you've had novelists on the mighty blaze and I've come around to the belief that philosophy is less about, um, has less in common with science than it does with literature actually, that, that, philosophy has been described as life enhancing poetry is one definition of it. And I love that. Right. And I think just like when you read a good novel, you put it down and it, it stays with you. Right. So the world looks a bit different for days, weeks, or months afterwards. And I think it's the same thing with philosophy. Each of these philosophers is saying to us here, put on these, these glasses, you know, they're my glasses and, you know, see how the world looks to you. And to me, that's the real value. If you get a few, pieces of truth nuggets along the way, well, good. But I don't think that's the objective necessarily. I couldn't agree more. I don't know if I've like ever quite heard somebody say that, certainly not in one of these interviews, this idea of like putting on spectacles, like that is what a reading of another author is. But I have found that so many times myself. I mean, not just in philosophy, but I think that's one of the main reasons why anybody goes to literature of any kind. I mean, Tolstoy is one of my favorite authors and he just has this like, extremely powerful way of like, you just start processing the world through Tolstoy's kind of all consuming eye. And right. you're just not, you're not even yourself anymore. You're just- Which is the objective, it, you, yeah. you've imbibed it. And um, that's why people, you know, people ask me like, did you, do you read about these philosophies? Did you, um, do you profile the philosophers? I'd like to, I think words matter. Well, you would agree with me on that. I like to think that I, I imbibe their philosophies and I encounter the philosophers. I mean, I try to encounter them as fully human beings. And I should say that they are not saints. You know, there's this tendency to put Socrates and all these others up on pedestals and as if they were perfect. And Socrates was annoying. You know, he was ugly by all accounts. I mean, one of the ugliest men in ancient Athens. Um, you know, Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, talked to his poodle uh, as if he were human. And uh, Rousseau, one of the oddest of the bunch, would expose his buttocks in public on more than one occasion. Um, this, this caused difficulty in his life, as you can imagine. And don't get me started on Nietzsche. So they were, all, yeah. they were, they had, they had problems. And they, we were talking about the academy and, and uh, academia. They, I didn't realize this till I finished the book. Someone, another interviewer pointed out that none of them stayed affiliated with academia. I mean, if they were, they broke away. Either they were forced out like Schopenhauer or they walked away from a tenured position like Nietzsche did. So they all had this sort of feral quality that I really admire. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all right, so another question I wanna ask is sort of like, um, you know, you look at your body of work um, and you know, there is this kind of like surveying quality, sort of like this is a free market of religions, a free market of spirituality, philosophy, what have you. And I'm going to kind of like sample for you some of what is out there so you can kind of like i can guide you or you can consume it yourself there's, there's a quote i want to read of yours um, about some, some of your spiritual explorations you said 
quote, I've found lots of wisdom and I've incorporated a lot of what I've learned from religions into my life, but I haven't fully converted to one. I'd like to think that what I'm trying to come up with is a kind of Ikea God, some assembly required. You take the best of each religion, but put it on top of a foundation. So I guess is that like sort of what you're up to here as well with philosophy, this kind of like Ikea yes. life philosophy? Yes, and as with Ikea furniture, it can be flimsy and the instructions are unclear, <laughs> you know? And you may have to call for help um, for your friend, the carpenter or the engineer. Um, but yes, I, I wrote that um, about religion in my book, Man Seeks God, or about the book. And I would say absolutely the same thing, even more so when it comes to philosophy. Because, you know, the problem with an Ikea God is people get upset if you're using, you know, pieces from a, a bookcase in your uh, dining room table. They're like, no, that's that's for the bookcase. But philosophers are, are really not as territorial, I think, uh, at least not not the way religions can be or political parties. And there's really nothing stopping you from constructing your own personal philosophy. And a philosophy should be personal. Otherwise, otherwise, what's the point? I mean, it's sort of open source. Open yeah, source. yeah, and and um, some are going to appeal to you more than others. The the Stoics, even before the pandemic, Stoicism was enjoying something of a resurgence. It was very popular, and that appeals to a lot of people because it's great for uncertainty. And I can see why it, it's appealing in these times. Um, but you can have a little stoicism and have a little Gandhi who read the Stoics and throw him in there too. And if you're a fan of Confucius, you can use him as well. There will be places where they, where they contradict, just like you're putting together that Ikea furniture, there's some pieces that are not gonna fit together. And if you force them, you're gonna break them. But I think in general, more fits than we think. And I, I just want to like, let's, let's do a little philosophy in action right now. I mean, you brought up the Stoics. Tell me, give me the Stoics um, applied philosophical reaction to the COVID crisis. Okay, I will give it to you by quoting Epictetus, the first line from his Inchiridion, which means the handbook. Some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. That's it. <laughs> and I, I first read it, you know, I had gone off the stoic camp in Wyoming, true story. And we're sitting around in a circle and, 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 um, and we read that, you know, out loud, that first line. And I'm thinking, man, I traveled 2000 miles by Amtrak. <laughs> to listen to that. It's what, but you know, sometimes th these obvious things are what we need. And we don't really know what we think we know, which is the basis of all philosophy, really. So to get back to that simple sentence, some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. The Stoics would say that we uh, don't really know that and we draw the line in the wrong place. We think that a lot is up to us and mainly outward success. If we're not rich enough or successful enough or beautiful enough, it's because we're not trying hard enough or we haven't found the right dermatologist yet, you know, but we just have to keep striving and it's up to us. Um, and they say no. In fact, um, when it comes to the outside world, the external elements of your life, very little is up to you. They thought it was faded, part of the logos, the sort of divine intelligence that runs through the universe. But they thought that what is up to us that we sort of abdicate is our internal life, our reactions to things. Um, it could be as simple as, you know, if you know, I were to bang my head into a table and I would go, ouch, you know, they would say, okay, that's a natural reaction. But if you then spend the rest of the day cursing the table and cursing myself for being such a klutz and worrying about possible brain damage from bumping my head or whatever it is, um, that I have abdicated that interior control. So when faced with a pandemic, something as big as this, the Stoics would say, okay, you know, this was never up to you. This idea that you would go to an office and your daughter would go to an actual school. You just, that's the way things had been, but they were really not up to you. Mm -hmm. What's up to you now is what you do with this. What you do with this, what is your reaction to it? And so it's oddly disempowering and empowering at the same time. Yeah. Stoic philosophy. Excellent, excellent. And that's your first chapter, right? Marcus Aurelius being a... Marcus was one of the Stoics. Um, he was a sort of appetizer of the book, I would say, the lightest chapter, because and, and also 
oddly the most important because if you don't get out of bed in the morning, um, but then you're not going to practice philosophy. He was a Stoic, a sort of um, by association, and he's often considered a Stoic. I circle back to one of his inspirations, who was Epictetus, the teacher, uh, later in the book in the in the How to Cope chapter. So I want to dig into three particular philosophers okay, um, in, in the book. Um, so there's there's 14 overall, correct? Right. There was going to be 15, but one was killed off. In, Ooh, oh, tell me. What's the director's cut version of this book? Director's cut would include Kierkegaard. Mm. Um, but, um, and I even, I took a train from Athens to Copenhagen, which is one <laughs> long train ride. <laughs> um, and lots of time to think. And I spent weeks in, in Copenhagen and weeks reading Kierkegaard. And I just, I couldn't condense him into his essence of that one how-to question. And um, I feel guilty about have killing him off, but um, yeah, he uh, he got the axe. So anyway, but but, but that, hold on, just I, I want to get into the three guys that are in what yes. two guys and one girl I want to talk about. But right. what um, it it's sort of interesting what you say. What is the re it, can you at least deduce what the reason is that you couldn't reduce him to is there something maybe slightly deficient about Kierkegaard in that way that or or deficient about me possibly <laughs> um uh he, his ideas were infused with Christianity but not as we conventionally think of it I wanted I tried hard to make this book as um I would say a religious is that a word irreligious um <laughs> not atheistic but simply uh devoid of that religious element as much as I could um, and certainly some of the philosophers like Simone Weil was a deeply spiritual person. So I, I bumped up against that. Um, you may hear Kierkegaard in the news these days because Joe Biden likes to quote him a lot. And the quote that he likes to use is faith sees best in the dark. Um, mm. and, uh, and Kierkegaard wrote about that leap of faith. I have a sneaking feeling that I'm going to be circling back to him, perhaps in some future work, like the one that got away. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also important to leave something on the cutting room floor, don't you? I mean, oh, for sure, for sure. If you're not yeah. leaving something on the cutting room floor, your book is probably bloated. Yeah, yeah. Now I've I've killed off religions and philosophers, and now and um, and yeah, that that condensing it. We're getting to craft talk here, but you know, my, my editor and I performed what he called editorial liposuction uh, on the <laughs> book, you know, and, and we trimmed it down to fighting form. And, and, you know, that's tough. But I, when I hear from readers saying, you know, one, actually one reviewer in the Washington Post said the book was like a box of chocolate truffles, so dense, and you have to eat them slowly. And I think that's, that's a compliment, mm. you know, you want that denseness. And, and that means trimming things down. And that means cutting off the, 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 killing off the philosophers who aren't working for you. But let's get to your three. Yeah, but I, but I love that quote, by the way. It speaks to the, another aspect of the book that I just really like, which is kind of like dip in, dip out quality. You know, you just feel like you can't read it all at once. And that's just a nice thing about it. You just like dip in, you read one chapter, then you dip in later, you read another and try on the different glasses. Yeah, I, I think that's a good sign. Like if you, if, you, if you find it difficult, just sit down with this book in one reading and you find you want to dip in and dip out. Um, I take that as a, as a compliment. I mean, yeah. my favorite author is one of my favorites, Italo Calvino, and I find with his books too, I'm dipping in and dipping out, um, yeah. not because I'm losing interest, but because I have too much interest in a way. Yeah, so. it's just too rich. It's too yeah. rich. Yeah. All right, so here we go. So, so okay. we have something in common, which is one of the strangest things that um, I think I've ever had in common with anybody. This is something that like only maybe my wife knows about me, but like I have probably read the Analects of Confucius on the New York City subway, cover to cover, like <laughs> more than five times. So there was this period I went through in my 20s where I just, that was maybe my favorite book in the world. And I, and it was such a revelation to me, that book. It sounds strange because Confucius, I don't think is like, it's not- yeah, like I, was, I was going to say that makes you an outlier, uh, yeah. even among readers of Chinese philosophy, because the, the, as I say in the book, the go-to Chinese philosopher is Lao Tzu and oh, Tao sure. Te Ching, you know, you know, effortless non-doing and you know every college student likes the idea of wow i'm doing but i'm not doing i'm <laughs> doing my homework but i'm not doing it's like and it's it's opaque and it's and it's it's lofty and spiritual and and it's and easy. confucius it's yeah in that sense it is confucius is hard confucius is not easy the analects um 
you know, another one of these books that he wrote but didn't write, but that's another story. Students put it together. Um, yeah, it's it's he's like, you know, he's wagging that finger at you to sit up straight and to behave properly. But there's, of course, a lot more to him than that, which I try to convey. So I'm, I'm impressed with your interest in him. Yeah, no, I, I, I can just like briefly explain why. Um, I mean, I think that like, so I was raised Christian. And, um, you know, I think like I, you know, my family, I had a came from a really great family. And, you know, I think a lot of Christianity is, um, at least the way it's practiced today in America, it's about family values and so on. But I think like, if you really like read what Jesus says in the gospel, it's a lot about dividing people from their families and like, come follow me. Like I'm going, like, who are my brothers and sisters? They're my followers and so on. And so I think that the thing that really struck me about Confucius was the focus on relationships. I mean, like there's so much in the Judeo-Christian tradition, including Islam, which is about like man's relationship to God. But here in Confucius, it was all about man's relationship to his teacher and to his brother and right. to like the other, you know, his general or whoever. Like there was just, it was all about this web of relationships. And to me, so much of like the greatest and most profound satisfactions in my life come from the relationships I have. And here was like a world religion that was about relationships. That's my naive take on right. it. Right. Although I think the relationships are not all... Um prosaic i think that um in chinese philosophy like in chinese architecture in chinese architecture um the city is laid out as a mirror of the cosmos of the order of the mm -hmm. cosmos and i think likewise what confucius was laying out was a mirror image of the cosmos in the web of relationships so no he was not overtly talking about your relationship with god or with the Tao, the way but he was i think also um, but he's immensely practical in that sense, you know, how to get along with people. And a lot of it is um, Lee or proper ritual conduct, which sounds just, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pretty loosey goosey guy. I'm, I'm not big on proper ritual or conduct, any of those three words. And, and yet it's like you dig beneath the surface. And as you probably found out, there's there's a lot of real wisdom there about mm. and the importance of ritual, which I write about that. Um, and, and there could be secular rituals in our lives. And think about this, you know, this past six, nine months, whatever month we're on in this God awful pandemic, I think people have leaned on ritual mm -hmm. um, and made up some rituals, perhaps, you know, the ritual can be the ritual of your morning coffee or tea. And mm -hmm. maybe that's become more elaborate. Um, and it can be a ritual for acting kindly toward people so yeah. you know when the best things happen in life like a wedding or the worst things like a funeral we turn to ritual because otherwise we i think we'd emotionally we'd be overwhelmed by them so well said i, I have nothing to add to that that was just that's exactly right and that's yeah. it's a lot of the value that confucius yeah. brings i think um anyway um next next one i want to talk about is the pillow book okay now i'm not going to can you just pronounce the author's name for me say shonagan Say Shonagan. Shonagan, yeah. Say Shonagan. Okay, so this is a Japanese author from about a thousand years ago or so, right. um, and she wrote this book called The Pillow Book, which I'm going to let you describe in a second. But the funny thing about it is that Jonathan Lethem's book, The Arrest, I had Jonathan Lethem on mm. last week. The characters in that book are talking about The Pillow Book too, and it's like I had never heard of The Pillow Book. I'd actually read your book before Jonathan's, but you know, until like three weeks ago, I'd never even heard of that book. And now I have like two authors in a row who are writing, you know, in depth about this book. Um, is there? It's like, a sign. It's a sign. What is, what is the sign? That's what I want to know. <laughs> you have to read The Pillow Book. <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't have to learn Japanese. There's some good translations out there. The odd thing is, no one knows why it's called The Pillow Book to this day. Okay. Is it because you know, she kept a diary, she did, um, a Seishon again, and did she keep it by her pillow? Or did she find writing the diary, keeping it was comforting like a pillow? Or nobody knows. Um, but it's, uh, it's kind of an intriguing title for a book, I think, in any language. And, and um, she was an observer of the palace in Kyoto, which was the capital of Japan at the time. And she was a great list maker. And she, the, the book is just sort of this compilation of lists, but highly opinionated lists, you know, it's almost like a giant Yelp, you know, in a way, it's like things, things I find utterly okashi, which back then meant delightful. Um, and it, she'd list these in great detail. And, and that is sort of the point is that, that 
normally I, and I lived in Japan for several years and I didn't think of the Japanese as being philosophical in sort of Western way, which they're not though. They're not, they're, they have a philosophy of things. They, that things, objects can convey meaning is what I conclude is, is the way of the Japanese. And that was the way of say Shonagun. And she found a lot of meaning in these objects that she described and people to some extent, but actually it was mainly the objects like mm. scenting, they used to have these scenting stands where you would like hang your kimono or your something over it and it would emit this scent. They were very, a very attuned sense of smell, for instance. Mm -hmm. They would have scent offs, competitions of who could concoct the best, um, the best incense. Um, and one scholar of this period calls it the whole Heian period, Heian means peace. They call it a cult of beauty. And I, mm -hmm. I love that. I think. I've always thought I might join a cult one day, you know, I'm pretty susceptible to these things and I wouldn't want to join the cult of beauty. I mean, that sounds like one even your parents would be okay with, you know, <laughs> like what happened to Mark? Oh, he went off and joined the cult of beauty, you know? <laughs> and- uh, it's That's how a, I think of the thoughtful bro. It really is a yeah, cult of beauty. It is a cult of beauty, <laughs> starting with the, the proprietor, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, I know, I realize a lot of, um, I include philosophers in the book that most most academics would not consider philosophers. Uh, Confucius probably would make the cut, but say Shonagun, you know, students, of, experts on philosophy would say, well, she was a writer or she was this. I think she was a philosopher. If, if philosophy is about seeing the world as otherwise, looking at it differently, I think absolutely she, she was a philosopher. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I, I did read some excerpts of it online that you can find. And uh, it, was, it was just very precise, very kind of small, controlled, and just kind of about these objects. I mean, it reminded me of ha some haiku that I've read, not an expert, but just kind of right. like the way haiku highlights like the kind of thingness of a thing, you know? Very well put, the thingness of the thing and the, and that the essence of the thing. And that's, that's what she's about. And, um, you know, there are different ways to philosophize. And, and Usually it's with words, but it doesn't have to be with words. Right. Okay. The last we have I have a number of questions that have come in already, but um, before okay. we get to that, the last philosopher I want to talk about is Nietzsche. Now, Nietzsche. I mean, <laughs> Inter I like your three selections, so it's interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, so okay, so you describe him in the book as philosophy's bad boy, the most seductive. I love this word seductive about Nietzsche. That is such an interesting choice and I think it's so true you describe kind of this playfulness the kind of bitingness um you know he wants to write a book that can dance it's sort of like how he judges works um and I of course probably like a lot of young people um just went through a whole Nietzsche phase where I mean I you know kind of around the same time that I was reading Confucius I went through all of Nietzsche and um you know I just um there's just two things I want to mention because I brought up this book before but Bertrand Russell had right. I, and I, in my opinion kind of an epic takedown of Nietzsche in the history of Western philosophy. He really doesn't like Nietzsche. And um, two of the reasons why I just thought they were sort of interesting that I recall him saying is that one is that he thinks Nietzsche doesn't so much have a coherent philosophy about describing reality as he has a wish to live in another historical time. Like basically Nietzsche wishes that he had been born a Roman, like in a time where there wasn't the slave morality and like, you know, conquerors could just be conquerors and that was that. And then the other thing he says about Nietzsche is that um, he doesn't like Nietzsche because Nietzsche is so fixated on pain. And, 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 you know, I mean, Bertrand Russell, I think just kind of like found that unhealthy, maybe yeah. a touch perverse. Okay, so let me jump in, can I jump yeah. in? Go, go, go. So I, 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 um, I agree with Russell that Nietzsche did not have a unifying theory of reality. And that would be true of pretty much all the philosophers here. No one's, no one's got it all together. Um, um, wanted to live in a different time. I don't know. I'd want to live in a different time too. I think the 1890s in New York would be pretty cool. I mean, as a travel writer, I think, yeah, around 1900, you know, when yeah. they were unex So yes, we all have these feelings. Um, but I, where I really disagree with Russell is the, the pain part. He, Nietzsche does write about pain and suffering, but I think that's because he was in a lot of pain. He, yeah. he had terrible health problems throughout his life. He get these awful migraine headaches and stomach upset. And that's why I found in particular his theory of eternal recurrence mm. fascinating. Now, this is the theory. Um, you're familiar with it? That oh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, that the world, that's it a, the audience, it, it's basically, it's Groundhog Day. Um, in fact, that's 
I'm sure where Groundhog Day came from was Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrence, but they're a bit different. So in Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, the universe repeats itself over and over. And that means you repeat yourself. And that means that, Mark, your life repeats itself, including this moment where you hear me say, Mark, that means your life repeats itself. You're going to hear that repeated for infinity in order, of course. Okay. Um, but you don't remember these repetitions. And you, unlike Groundhog Day, you can't edit it out. So this is the really interesting part, I think, is what Nietzsche says, so this messenger comes to you and says, Mark, this is the way things are. They repeat themselves. Do you want to repeat this life as it is? And it's really a thought experiment that requires you to stop and say, is this the life I want to be living for mm. all of eternity? Is this worth all of eternity? And, you know, it's easy to say, okay, that day I, you know, met that woman in the Bahamas, that was great. I would repeat that day. And when I won the lottery and all those, things. yeah, but what about, you know, seventh grade? What about the year 2020? You want to repeat this whole freaking mm -hmm. year again, you know, and mm -hmm. what it requires. And Nietzsche ultimately comes to the conclusion that yes, he would. And that, that uh, when I ask this of people, most people say, when they think about it, yeah, I would do it all over again. It's like if you, one variation of this is the marriage test. Say you recently divorced, you know, would you repeat, would you marry that person again, knowing you would end in divorce? Mm -hmm. Most people say yes. And so it's, 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 yes, it's writing about pain and suffering, but I think Nietzsche comes around to this place of radical acceptance and celebration of the whole enchilada of life, including the bad bits, which is, which is what eternal recurrence demands we accept. And All Eric, let me ask you about eternal recurrence quickly. I mean, I understand the concept and I understand it as a thought experiment, but can I ask you, did Nietzsche believe kind of metaphysically that this is what happened he, he, or he, was it a thought experiment? He, now he, he was working on that and okay. he has in his unpublished notes, extensive notes, sort of sketching out how this might be true, referring to the Pythagoreans and to Hindu mythology, which has similar ideas of these repeating cycles of time. He never felt comfortable enough to publish these theories. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of debate about whether he was quote unquote serious of it, about it or not. Um, to me, it doesn't have to be true to be useful. And I think that's sort of one of my takeaways from philosophy is it need not be quote unquote true to be useful. Yeah. William James, the American philosopher said, truth is what works, which does not mean you can say two plus two equals five, but it can mean that looking at the world this way, say through Nietzsche's eyes, makes my life richer and more meaningful. Therefore it works for me. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Thought, ex thought experiments are not just thought experiments. They can be very powerful. It is, it's so powerful. Uh, yeah. The eternal return is extremely powerful. And I get it. Um, all right. So I'm going to ask you a couple audience questions. One, which of the philosophers that you included in the book has had the biggest impact on your life? Got to choose one. I'm going to have to choose two. <laughs> it's a tie <laughs> between, I would say, Gandhi, um, who um, I've been a fanboy of Gandhi the way you were of Confucius. And I lived yeah. in India and I met his grandson and had lunch with him. And, um, wow. and Gandhi for his, um, the way he fought, he was, he, the mm. chapter's called How to Fight Like Gandhi. Um, and he just, he had this sort of fierce idealism and um, it, that appealed to me and continues to appeal to me. And this idea of fighting opponents, but never enemies, something we could all learn right now. And the other who was, uh, I was not nearly as familiar with was Montaigne. Um, mm -hmm. Probably the philosopher I'd most want to have a beer with, I would say, because he, you know, he comes at the end of the book and he, he sort of parallels my own explorations in my book, which is he starts off in the essays, which he wrote and he, he actually, um, founded the genre of the essays they didn't really exist an essay comes from the french essay of course means to try an attempt so he's trying and he's first he's hesitant and he's quoting from the ancients from cicero and seneca and as you read on in the 700 or so pages of the essays um he starts to get bolder about his own opinion and starts to use the first person more and i felt like that was sort of my journey too that i you know first was leaning heavily in first drafts of the book, quoting more from the other philosophers, little reticent to voice my opinion, but became more confident. And yeah, Montaigne was, he was an amateur philosopher like myself. He was the mayor of Bordeaux. He was an equestrian. He was a traveler like me, but you know, he wasn't a 
professional philosopher, but yet he he sort of grew into it. So yeah, those two, Gandhi and Montaigne. Awesome, awesome. Okay, here's another question. Um, is, uh, I'm going to preface it with a very nice note from this reader. I love the book, love the humil humility and humor and simplicity, encouraging the reader to consider his or her own life in a very non-threatening way. Um, and then the question is, have you heard back from other readers and what have other readers responded to in the work? I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, so this is again a partly craft talk, but I wrestle with that line between simplifying and oversimplifying, mm. and um, and it's tricky. And I think one thing important to do as a writer is to not attempt to be comprehensive, unless you're Bertrand mm. Russell, then I guess you can. But um, to be selective, and when you're selective, you're um, you know some people you'll get some, but what about ism? You know you wrote about Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. What about his subjectivism? You just, you know, no, I was, I'm, I focused on that one idea. And so I've, I've heard from readers and um, in, including one from federal prison just the other day and um, other people. And it's been very reassuring to hear mm. people, especially people who say they would not have picked up a book on philosophy or that they wish they had majored it in, in college, but they didn't, or they flunked out. Um, and people, you know, people who get it. There are people who say, oh, that was a good book. And there are people like this person who, who really get it, <coughs> excuse me, for the right reasons. And it's been reassuring because I really think there is a hunger out there for wisdom. And you know, we don't have many great sources. I mean, we've got our smartphones and they're great at knowledge and information, but not wisdom. We've got religion, but that's problematic for a lot of people. So pop psychology has sort of filled in the void, but even that's not fully satisfying. So I'm like, there's this thing called philosophy, love of wisdom, let's return to that. Well, I mean, one thing in that, that reader comment that the word that I picked up on was non-threatening. And that, that sort of goes back to what I was saying about my philosophy course in London almost. I mean, like, what, why is it that it, it sounds like the book being non-threatening is like a key appeal? I, I think that's actually the high praise yeah. to be non-threatening, because that means as an author, I'm inviting the reader in like this and not mm -hmm. putting up my hand like that. And... Um, and it, it is a balancing act because you're not going to please the expert philosopher. Well, I, I take that back. I, I've had some professional philosophers who, who get the book and appreciate it. And I, I really like that. But you have to be willing to alienate some experts in order to be non-threatening. Mm. To me, like a book should never be threatening. It can be challenging. It can be difficult in patches but it should not be threatening. Yeah, totally agreed. All right, we have one more question from the audience and then one more question from me. This okay. last question from the audience is gonna be hard to get through quickly, but um, the question is just about, the question like lists your books and says, <laughs> try, to, try to answer this in 30 seconds. What is the thread that is winding through all these books? And I sort of had a similar question myself. I mean, it's just, you're, you are constantly on this search. You are, you are this kind of, questing individual across your books. And uh, I, I love this question from the audience. It's like, what is the thread that could summarize this, this quest? I would say in 30 seconds, the thread is this, that uh, the options available to us at any moment on this planet are much greater than we think. That um, th there are more possibilities of possibility than we can imagine and we unnecessarily narrow our choices. And travel is, you know, the way, I, I often say that I look at the world as a laboratory of ideas and of good ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's, it's, my books are just one, one giant lab experiment in, in the world of ideas. Wow, amazing. Okay, cool. So this is my last question. I ask this question to everybody who comes on the show. So imagine if you will, that you have an ideal reader for your book. This is somebody who is just everything you wanted to accomplish, like they're getting it, they're getting every joke, they're getting every line, they let, they're, they're just drinking it all in, in just the way that you had hoped. Um, now that person gets to the end of the book, they close the book and just describe to me in a kind of, you know, word or a phrase, what is the feeling that this reader is left with? 
Hmm. I never thought about it that way. And that's it. <laughs> um, I, I really, um, I want, I, I don't provide pat answers um, to these questions, but uh, I would like the reader to put the book down. And as I suggested earlier in our conversation to have that different pair of glasses on and to look at, to see the world a bit differently, to see their life a little bit differently. Um, and in ways that may not be directly related to the book of mine they just read. Yeah. Um, because ideally a book is bigger than that, right? So that mm -hmm. you don't just say, oh, um, I got into a fight at the box store, so um, I'm gonna get Gandhian. No, it could be some idea you come up on your own and invent it. Yeah. So um, if, if, if the reader is left with that um, life, since they're having read life enhancing poetry, even in prose form, um, then I will be satisfied. Awesome. Well, I can attest it does do that. Um, I love the book. Eric, could you hold up the book one more time so people can see it? I can hold up the book. I should have been holding it the entire time. Like, <laughs> yes, this should have been our conversation, you, you know? Folks, my, make my, an my, impulse buy. I think Socrates himself would advise you to make an impulse buy here and just, just click. We put the links in the chat. Go ahead and buy it. Thank you. You're one, you living up to your title, thoughtful bro. <laughs> <laughs> That is high praise. That is it high is. Praise. I mean, seriously, you're going to call yourself the thoughtful bro. You, you know, <laughs> this was so much better than the other show I was on, the thoughtless bro. That was just <laughs> not, that was no fun at all. <laughs> um, oh but I like the way you think and I like your interest in Confucius. And um, this was, this was good. This was, and Socrates, I would add, I know we're running out of time. Yeah. He would say that, that what we just did here was philosophy because he thought yeah. philosophy was conversation we two are bouncing ideas off each other and you know the, the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts when it comes to ideas awesome great place to end eric thank you so much best of luck with the book it's outstanding and folks we'll see you next week on a thoughtful bro thanks eric thank you bye mark